Hello, everyone. I'm just going to give everyone a few minutes to join as the webinar goes live. Hello to everyone joining. I'm just going to give it a few minutes to let all the audience members join as the webinar goes live. Okay, everyone. Hello and welcome to June 2022 ISGIP Live Journal Club. I'm your moderator, Natalie Benet, and this month's theme is uterine cervix. While everyone is joining the webinar, I'd like to talk about some upcoming events for ISGIP Live. On the 22nd of June, the ISGIP Live podcast will go live at 12 noon. That's on the SoundCloud page. And it's an interview with Dr. Nilgun Kapujuoglu on the reproducibility of the IECC criteria in endocervical adenocarcinoma, which is very prescient for today's um, journal club as well. Also on the 22nd of June at 12 noon Eastern time is um, the interesting case presentations by pathology trainees and early career pathologists moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett. And then um, a lot of the ISGIP Live modalities are taking a break in July, but Journal Club will happen on the 21st of July at 12 Australian Eastern Standard Time, which is actually the 20th of July in the U.S. at 10 p.m. So if you're a night owl, please be, feel free to join. And that's moderated by Dr. Karen Talia. You can register for all of these events at isgip.ca. Um, you can also access the SoundCloud page. There's a link to get to the podcast from isgip.ca. And there's also a link if you would like to become an isgip member. Keep in mind it's free for trainees so that you can access all of the past recorded content from these educational events. Journal Club is available globally, as I just highlighted. So every other month, it's available at 12 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. That's the third Wednesday, moderated by myself. And the uh, remaining months, it's available at 12 p.m. Melbourne time in Australia, which is corresponds to the third Thursday of the month, and that's moderated by Dr. Karen Talia. This is the schedule for the remainder of the year. You can see we are in June, which is uterine cervix, and next month, as I highlighted, is ovary uh, slash germ cell tumors and GTD. And I do have some exciting news today. I have, um, I'm have i thrilled to announce that we have a new moderator for Journal Club, Dr. Becca Wolski. Um, she will eventually be taking over for me over the next coming months. And uh, Dr. Wolski is an assistant professor and the director of gynecological and obstetric pathology at the University of Colorado, also um, a fellow gynecological pathologist. And um, she's here today on the panel to observe and we are thrilled to welcome her. And just a reminder as well, if you are on the webinar and would like to present, please reach out. Um, and ISCHIP Live does have um, the, also the interesting case presentation modality uh, moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett. So if you would like to present at any of these, you can email us at the email addresses shown there. Dr. Talia is also listed. Keep in mind, we offer mentorship and practice ahead of the events. So if you or your trainees or early career pathologists would like to um, participate, please reach out. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Dr. Rachel Mendoza. She is a GYN pathology fellow at the University of Chicago in Chicago in the US and a future cytopathology fellow at the same institution. Second, we have Dr. Reedan Balakarishnan. He is a surgical oncology pathology fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, also in the US and a future GYN pathology fellow at the University of Chicago. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Lan Zhang, who is a fourth year pathology resident, um, not for much longer though, at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Um, she's also um, going to do a surgical pathology fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and then she is going to be a GYM pathology fellow at my institution at Cleveland Clinic. So welcome to all three of you today. And this month's theme is uterine cervix. So first we'll have Dr. Mendoza presenting an article by Park 
um, and colleagues entitled Immunohistochemical and Genetic Characteristics of HPV-Associated Endocervical Carcinoma with an Invasive Stratified Mucin-Producing Component. And that came out in Modern Pathology in September of 2021. And then Dr. Balakarishnan will present an article by Talia and colleagues entitled Precursor Lesions of Cervical Clear Cell Carcinoma Evidence for Origin from Tubo Endometrial Metaplasia. And that came out in um, the ISGIP journal in March of this year. And finally, Dr. Lan Zhang will present an article by Ren and colleagues entitled International Endocervical Adenocarcinoma Criteria and Classification, an Independent Cohort with Clinical and Molecular Findings. And that also came out in the ISGIP journal in November of last year. So the learning objectives are here, and I won't read them to you because I put them up here every month, but just to remind everyone that we do want to engage trainees and offer mentorship and um, opportunities for these people to present um, so um, those are laid out there. And this is the guide that the presenters use to prepare their presentations for you. If you'd like to take a screenshot of it, this is how they prepare their PowerPoint presentations and how they evaluate the article. And with that, here's the schedule for today. After my intros, we'll have Dr. Mendoza, then Dr. Balakarishnan, then Dr. Zhang. And at the end, we'll have wrap up questions and discussion. And for those not familiar, although most of us probably are at this point with the Zoom webinar format, keep in mind the black bar at the bottom of your screen is where you'll put in questions for the um, speakers today. And so you hit that Q&A button. And if you see someone else's question and you like it, you can actually hit the thumbs up button to prioritize it for answering. If you have um, feedback or just a general comment for the presenters or me, you can put it in the chat. Or if you'd like at the beginning to tell us where you're joining from, we'd also appreciate that. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And um, Dr. Mendoza, I, in, I invite you to share yours and go ahead and start your presentation when you're ready. I think you're muted, but I can see your screen. Awesome. OK, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Benet. And thank you for the opportunity to present for the East Tube Live Journal Club. I am here to present a paper that was done by Dr. Yunnan Park and colleagues in Yonsei University College of Medicine, Seoul, Korea. And this is regarding the immune chemical and genetic characteristics of invasive stratified mucin producing carcinoma, or ISMC. Dr. Mendoza, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Can you move the microphone closer to your mouth? Thank yes. you. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, okay. Um, so let me just give a brief um, background on ISMC. ISMC is the invasive form of SMILE, um, and SMILE is also known as your stratified mucin producing intraepithelial lesion that was first described in the year 2000. It is an HPV associated um, lesion that is composed by your stratified mucin producing um, additional cells that may have a variable amounts of intracytopathic mucin vacuoles and they have a hybrid morphology of glandular squamous differentiation. And it has been recognized as a variant of adenocarcinoma in situ in the WHO classification of female genital tumors in 2014. ISMC, on the other hand, was first recognized only in 2016, and it is described to have uh, to, to compose of invasive solid mass of stratified columnar cells, again, with variable amounts of intracytoplasm increase in vacuoles. Um, this type of um, invasive carcinoma is often mixed with the other type of cervical carcinoma. Most of them are your HPV-associated um, adenocarcinoma. And this entity was recognized in the WHO 2020 as a variant of HPV-associated endocervical adenocarcinoma. This is a case of SMILE to be encountered last year. And as you can see, the lesional cells is composed of this mucin producing um, stratified um, cells that is strongly positive for your P16. This is the um, different morphologic appearance of ISMC as published by um, Dr. Stolniki and colleagues. And they emphasize in their paper that the ISMC does show morphologic, including architectural and cytologic diversity. Therefore, it is very difficult sometimes to recognize ISFC, especially in mixed carcinoma cases. Because of the phenotypic plasticity of ISMC, there is a, a, a sort of question as to the cell of origin of, of ISMC 
So this study aims to find out the origin of ISFC, particularly investigating if they do come from the cervical reserve cells, and then associate the cell of origin to the spectrum of stemness and epithelial mass and primary transition that may explain the phenotypic plasticity and aggressive behavior of this tumor. This is a single institution study with a retrospective analysis. The authors started their case selection in a 10-year period, and they were able to identify um, 200 cases of cervical adenocarcinoma, 165 of which was a variant of adenocarcinoma, 34 were adrenal screenings, and only one was diagnosed as a mixed ISMC. Now, after further histologic review of two gynecologic pathologies included in the paper, they were able to identify nine additional ISMC cases that were previously diagnosed as other adenocarcinoma type. And they subjected these overall 10 ISMC cases to immunohistochemistry, HPV genotyping, and next generation sequencing. The study also included 14 controls composing of seven usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma and seven cervical squamous cell carcinoma to use as a comparison. For the results, the 10 ISMC patients had a median age of diagnosis of 50.5 years, ranging from 37 to 75 years. And of note, all of the 10 cases were positive for HPV type 18. Two cases additionally had um, HPV type 16 and HPV type 52. Most patients were diagnosed as FIGO stage 1B. And after a follow-up median period of 32.8 months, um, three patients died of the disease, six patients were negative for the disease, and one is still alive with disease. In terms of pathology, the average tumor size is 3.5 centimeters, and the average invasion depth is 2.1 centimeters. A large majority of the cases showed a silver pattern C of invasion, as well as lymphovascular invasion. And nine out of the 10 cases were associated with an intraepithelial lesion, most of them being smile, as expected. And out of the 10 ISMC cases, only two of them were actually pure ISMC, and eight were admixed with other um, endocervical carcinoma type. And most commonly, it is admixed with intestinal type mucinous adenocarcinoma. This slide shows you the different morphologic appearance of the 10 ISMC cases that were included in this paper. Figure A here shows the overlying smile component and the underlying invasive ISMC component. And most of the cases here shows the characteristic appearance of ISMC as shown in figure B, wherein you have this um, peripheral palisading tumor cells that surrounds the stratified mucinous lesional cells. Um, and C, some of the lesional cells actually can form some lumen, um, mimicking some granular formation. And some of the cases have this um, uh, papillary formation as in figure D. Figure E and F shows um, some poorly cohesive mucinous producing cells, um, some of them with this extravasated mucin. The paper also note, um, such as in uh, figure, as shown in figure G, that the cases that is admixed with the intestinal type adenocarcinoma the ISMC component tend to be intimately admixed with the, uh, with the intestinal type adenocarcinoma component, um, therefore suggesting that there might be some phylogenetic relationship with the um, intestinal type adenocarcinoma. And they have one case wherein the, um, the ISMC is admixed uh, with adenoid basal carcinoma and adenoid squamous carcinoma. However, the ISMC component in this case is spatially separate from the two other components. In terms of the immunohistochemical findings, there is no difference between the expression uh, in the expression of P16K67 and P53 among the three entities that were compared. The ISMC um, uh, cases uh, had strong and diffuse P16 expression, increased K67 proliferation in within the wild type P53 expression, similar to your usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. However, in terms of the expression for PAX8, CK56, and P63, the ISMC cases um, were significantly different in terms of the expression from the usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. 
the ISMC cases showed negative to borderline positivity for Pax8, and the CK56 and P63 had this peculiar expression wherein they're more expressed strongly towards the peripheral palisading tumor cells, um, supporting the fact that they may be coming from the um, reserve cells of the cervix. In investigating the, um, the stemless properties of, of ISMC cases, the authors decided to investigate ALDH1 and MANOG expression. These two are transcription factors that are responsible to um, to uh, support the stemness um, properties in tumor cells. And the expression of ALDH1 and NANA in previous studies had been associated with poor prognosis and poor differentiation in tumors. And they found that ALDH1 is actually positive in 90% of their ISMC cases, which is significantly higher than the usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. In investigating the epithelial mesenchymal transition, the authors investigated the expression of snail, twist, and ink adherin. Snail and twist are transcription factors as well, and they encode for, um, uh, uh, they support the encoding of certain um, proteins that will lead to increased uh, migratory and invasiveness of epithelial tumors. And the increased expression of these two are also associated with poor prognosis and increased uh, uh, increase, uh, uh, increase um, invasiveness of tumors, and they are found to be positive in 90% of ISMC, which are significantly higher compared to the usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. Snail and twist also down regulates the expression of e adherin, and e adherin is decreased in about 40% of ISMC, which is also significantly different from the other two tumors. In the genetic analysis, the most commonly altered genes in ISMC cases are your KMT2C, STK11, MET, ERBB2, and KMT2D. The authors um, compared the genetic alterations between the pure type cases and the mixed type cases, and they found that the common genetic alterations between the two cases were STK11, MET, ERBB2, and KMT2D. Additionally, the authors also compared the 10 ISMC cases from the TCA, TCGA data available for your adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, and they found four um, genes that were distinctly, uh, distinctly different and unique for ISMC, and these are your STK11 again, MET, FANCA, and PALB2. They also found several EMT-related genes that are altered in ISMC. The authors also emphasized that two out of their three SDK11 mutant cases had presented with distant metastasis of diagnosis and died of disease, so they suggested that the SDK11 alteration may be associated with worse prognosis. In comparing the clinical pathologic features of ISMC cases from the other HPV-related subtypes in their cohort, they found that IS the ISMC cases have significantly larger tumor size they presented with more frequent LPSI and lymph node invasion, and they also had higher FIGO stage of diagnosis. They also compared the overall survival of the ISMC patients from the HPV-associated subtypes and from the HPV-independent subtypes, and they found that there is a trend towards worse prognosis in your ISMC cases, and there is no significant difference from the survival of patients with HPV-independent subtypes, which we all know were worse than your HPV-associated subtypes. So in this study, the authors were able to emphasize that IMC cases have been misdiagnosed as other virus subtypes of carcinoma of the cervix because of its morphologic diversity. Also, the ISMC cases, both mixed and pure, showed more aggressive clinical pathologic features and worse prognosis when compared to the other HPV um, associated, associated subtypes. They, they were also able to identify three immunohistochemical stains that can be used as supportive diagnostic markers and are expressed differently in your ISMC cases, and these are your PAX-8, CK-5-6, and P-63. 
there is also higher expression of your stemness markers and EMT markers in ISMC, therefore providing sort of mechanism for definitive plasticity and prognosis, as well as aggressive behavior and metastatic potential of ISMC cases. They were able to identify genetic alterations that were unique in ISMC, and these are your STD11, MET, BANCA, and BALB2 genes. For the strength of this paper, this is the first investigation to date of the stemness and ENT prone features of ISMC. This paper also provided a comprehensive genetic analysis of ISMC, even comparing the mix and pure type, as well as comparing it from the uh, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma to cervix. They were also able to suggest a practical immunity skeptical pattern, a panel for the workup of ISMC cases, and their data confirms prior data on the aggressive behavior and prognosis of ISMC. Some areas of improvement include the low number of ISMC cases that were included in the study, and also um, there is a suggestion to further study the significance and the underlying mechanism in the stemness and EMT properties in particular in uh, ISMC cases. Some practical applications that we can apply in our daily diagnostic workup is the um, use of the immunity chemical pa uh, panels such as your PAC6, CK5, 6 and P63. ISMC can be very challenging because of its architectural uh, diversity. So these panels can be uh, helpful to differentiate it from your adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma to cervix. There's also an emphasis on, on the importance of identifying ISMC components and even stating the percentage of ISMC because as this study has proven or shown that pure and mixed ISMC showed similarly worse um, outcomes. There's also a proposed molecular mechanism for the aggressive behavior of ISMC as the ISMC actually showed more um, stemness and EMT point features, which can contribute to the poor clinical pathologic characteristics of plants. And with that, I would like to thank you. Great. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you for that picture at the end. We all need. Um, I think that was a really good job. That paper, uh, like we talked about in practice, was um, really unique and um, had some new new things, at least to me, this, this idea of stemness, which I think kind of gets to the heart of what's going on with these tumors probably being, you know, worse actors, even amongst the group of tumors that we're talking about. And I think you did a good job summarizing it. There was a lot to cover in there. So thank you so much for that. And audience, remember, you can put your questions in the Q&A and um, Dr. Mendoza and I, and we'll we'll get to that at the end. So now I would invite um, Dr. Balakarishan to share his screen. And okay, all right, looks good. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity to present at the Journal Club. Uh, so my name is Radhan Balakrishnan. I'm a surgical oncology pathology fellow at MSK uh, in New York, and I will be going to the University of Chicago at the GYN fellow uh, in July this year. So this is the topic for my paper. Uh, it's titled Precursor Lesions of Cervical Clear Cell Carcinoma Evidence for Origin from origin from tuber endometrial metaplasia. This paper was recently published in the International Journal of Gynecologic Pathology this year, and uh, these are the authors, and one of the senior authors is Dr. McPluggage. So let's start with the study design. Like, what was the premise of this paper? We know that cervical clear cell carcinoma is an HPV independent tumor, and historically it has been associated with in utero exposure to DES. However, with the cessation of DES use, uh, most contemporary cases are sporadic and we don't really understand the pathogenesis, and we don't really have an established precursor lesion. So keeping this in mind, uh, when the authors observed uh, a few incidentally uh, found early stage cl uh, cervical clear cell carcinomas, what they saw was there was tuber endometrial metaplasia adjacent to these tumors. And that got them thinking, and then they hypothesized that TM is a possible precursor to sporadic cervical clear cell carcinoma. So this led them to review a series of excisional biopsies and resections to support the claim. 
Uh, before we get into the paper itself, uh, I wanted to get into the definitions of DEM and surgical clear cell carcinoma as defined by the authors. So in terms of definition, so DEM, uh, these are architecturally normal endocervical glands, uh, which are lined by a mixture of ciliated cells, non-ciliated columnar cells, and intercalated or peg cells. They also define what atypia would mean within these glands. And uh, so if you saw nuclear hypochromasia, enlargement, some membrane irregularities, nucleoli, and stratification, these would be considered atypical. But the thing to note is that it, these atypical, atypical glands always retain surface cilia. This is a whole spectrum of DEM. So on the top left, you have more of the endometrioid metaplasia with pseudostratification and cilia here. At the bottom left, you have the more cookie cutter uh, tubal metaplasia. On the top right is something that would perhaps qualify for atypia. You have some hyperchromasia, nuclear membrane irregularities, uh, some nucleoli, but you see that the, there is still retained cilia in these glands. And then clear cell carcinoma it is defined as a neoplastic proliferation of relatively uniform but atypical cells. Uh, and the diagnostic feature is the patterns of growth in this. So you have tubular cystic, papillary, and solid architecture, and you can have hobnailing uh, of cells as well. So on the top left, you have the tubular cystic uh, morphology. You have the papillary growth pattern over here, a more solid uh, architecture here. And over here, you have the hobnailing architecture. So methods. Uh, so there were eight cases of cervical clear cell carcinomas that were collected in-house and consult cases. Uh, none, of this, none of these had any known history of in utero DES exposure. And that is important because we're trying to know what the pathogenesis of sporadic uh, clear cell carcinoma in the cervix is. Uh, the first three cases were the index cases, which were the small and incidental early clear cells uh, excised within uh, cervical large loop excision of the transformation zone. Then we had four cases, which were hysterectomies with more extensive, uh, locally extensive, uh, clear cell carcinomas. And then there was one case which was an excision of multiple large cervical polyps. And in all cases, an endometrial primary was excluded. So let's get into the cases. Case one was a 39 year old woman who underwent a cervical uh, LLETZ for CIN. Um, uh, there were a small number of glands near the transformation zones that were morphologically compatible with uh, clear cell carcinoma. And what they found next to it was gland showing TEM. Uh, immunohistochemistry was done on these uh, glands and the ones that were clear cell carcinoma stained uh, diffusely positive with napsin A and HNF1 beta is only focally positive for ER. The TEM that were adjacent uh, were negative for napsin A and diffusely positive for ER. These are some pictures from the first case in which you have uh, uh, focus of clear cell carcinoma uh, over here and over here, and it is beautifully staining with uh, napsin A. Case two was a 32 year old woman who underwent the same procedure for a biopsy confirmed CIN3. Again, at the transformation zone, there were cells that were morphologically compatible with clear cell carcinoma, and there was uh, TEM in proximity to the tumor. In terms of immunohistochemistry, it uh, had similar findings as the first case. This is a picture showing the tumor. In this case, you have these dilated glands with hobnailing cells, which are again positive for HNF1 beta and napsin A. Case three was a 42 year old woman with a previous history of uh, CIN2, and uh, she underwent the same procedure for a suspected high grade CIN. Yet again, there was clear cell carcinoma in the transformation zone and several glands uh, showing TEM admixed with the tumor. In terms of IHCs, these again stained uh, similar to the prior cases. This case was good in terms of uh, showing the proximity of uh, TEM over here, uh, which is adjacent to the clear cell carcinoma, as you can see. Over here in the second figure, you have a normal gland that's partially replaced by TEM and you have an adjacent focus of clear cell carcinoma. The bottom two figures are a good uh, representation of the atypia uh, that was defined by the authors. So you have uh, a little bit of hyperchromasia, some pseudostratification. 
in these glands with DEM and it is adjacent to clear cell carcinoma. Uh, the, re the remaining cases occur in women who were aged 49 to 87 years old. Uh, and again, all five cases showed DEM in the vicinity of uh, uh, atypia. In one case, there was uh, even a transition between the clear cell carcinoma and DEM in the same individual glands. Uh, in terms of immunostaining, uh, again, these stain is expected. So getting into the discussion slash literature review, this paper did a really good job in exploring the historical landscape of this lesion. And it talked about all the prior papers that led up to uh, the papers, the current papers. Uh, I would, I was, I'm not able to do justice by going through every one of those papers, but I really wanted to emphasize on this particular paper by Roboy et al, which had very similar findings to the one in our paper. So in 1984, uh, they identified foci of atypical tuboendometrial epithelium in 16 out of 20 cases of uh, completely submitted clear cell carcinomas of the vagina and cervix. Uh, they labeled it atypical vaginal adenosis and atypical cervical ectropion, respectively. In 90% of these cases, the tumors were partially or completely surrounded by DEM or tuboendometrial epithelium. And they, when they were present, they were usually in very close proximity, just like in our current paper. So it was suggested that these so-called atypical vaginal adenosis and atypical cervical ectropion of the TE type represent precursors of clear cell carcinoma. So uh, these are images from this paper and you can see there is a focus of uh, clear cell carcinoma here. And then adjacent to it, you have a focus of uh, TEM and higher power, there is some degree of cytologic atypia. So conclusions, the authors conclude that the presence of TEM in close proximity to the eight cases that they looked at of sporadic clear cell carcinoma adds weight to this hypothesis that TEM may be implicated in the pathogenesis of cervical clear cell carcinoma. So this, the results of this study adds to the sparse ex existing literature proposing uh, that DEM is a precursor to sporadic cervical clear cell carcinoma uh, with pro possible progression via an atypical transition phase to malignancy. Uh, and I, yet again, uh, I wanna mention that it was notable in the cases that uh, there was proximity of DEM and clear cell as seen by Roba et al. Let's talk about some of the strengths and areas for improvement in this paper. Uh, in terms of strength, I really, uh, I want to commend the literature review that was done by the authors. Uh, there was really good overview of the history and landscape of the topic. Uh, they did a good job in including cases that were arising only in the cervix. Uh, and they really de defined TEM and clear cell carcinoma criteria really, uh, well. And they also talked about the atypia. In terms of weaknesses, uh, so there was a small number of cases which the authors acknowledged. Uh, they also acknowledged that there was no molecular or large scale profiling done. Um, uh, there was, uh, I found the image, I found that the image quality could have been slightly better. In some cases, it was difficult to appreciate the uh, cytologic features and higher power. Um, and they also never really defined what close proximity meant in terms of a distance. Uh, Another thing that could be improved upon was there was no control group. So a possible future study would be looking at the incidence of TEM with atypia in patients without cervical clear cell carcinoma and comparing these to patients that we have in this cohort. Uh, before we end, I just wanted to uh, talk about another recent paper that was published. Uh, and as we know, there is not a lot of work that was done uh, in describing the molecular landscape of these lesions. So this is a recent paper that was published. Uh, the authors here uh, used a combination of whole exome sequencing and targeted capture and RNA sequencing. And they found pathogenic alterations in the HIPAA signaling pathway in 50% of the cases that had clear cell carcinomas of the cervix. And they found this particular mutation in 40% of the cases, which is the WWTR1S89W. And all cases, regardless of the, whether the, there was a mutation or not, uh, showed some features of hippopathic uh, dysregulation at both the transcriptomic and protein levels. 
And the conclusion was that clear cell carcinoma may be a convergent phenotype, which is dependent on like the deregulation of this pathway. So I would recommend everyone to go check this paper out. And this is probably the start of the molecular understanding of this entity. These are my references and uh, thank you once again for listening. Great, thank you, Dr. Balakarishna. I think you did a really nice job summarizing that paper. Um, I agree with you. I mean, we've already practiced, so it's kind of cheating, but I agree with all the points you made about their discussion. I always say that um, you know, Dr. McCluggage's papers, um, if you wanna understand an entity, you can not only read his articles, but also read his discussion to understand the prior um, literature on the subject. So thank you so much. Um, and now we'll have our final presenter, Dr. Zhang, you can go ahead and share your screen and start when you're ready. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Bennett, for this opportunity to present on this journal club. So I'm Lan Zheng, I'm the pathology resident, PGY4, from University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Today, I'm gonna present uh, article published in International Journal of Gynecological Pathology uh, from last year. Um, this is an uh, independent cohort uh, study uh, to uh, revalidate the international endocervical adenocarcinoma criteria and classification, also known as IECC. The authors are listed here. So a little bit background of the and those are recording of carcinoma in the 2014 uh, WHO criteria as uh, those are recording of carcinoma are classified uh, mainly based on the morphology. There are certain issues, for example, in the neurosynthesis carcinoma, they all uh, diagnosis based on morphology and also it includes a gastric type, which is solely HPV uh, independent. So this group of mutinous carcinoma under the adenocarcinoma classification is a heterogeneous group of tumors with different pathogenesis, HPV status, and tumor behavior. Another example is an endometrioid carcinoma. This tumor also purely diagnosis with morphology. However, it's really difficult to differentiate uh, mucin depleted uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma from the endometrial carcinoma, uh, primarily from the, the uterine corpus. So uh, the, the newly published uh, IECC, along with the uh, 2020 WHO, uh, divided endocervical adenocarcinoma into two main categories, which is HPV associated. HPVA and HPV independent, also known as HPVI. So this um, classification provide a simple hierarchical scheme with greater inter-observer reproducibility and clinical relevance. So the purpose of this study is a single institution retrospective review of endocervical adenocarcinoma cases to provide independent validation of the IECC framework. And it also assess the mutational differences between the HPVA and HPVI endocervical adenocarcinoma using next generation sequencing panels. So all the endocervical adenocarcinoma were identified in the resection specimen uh, from the archives of Vancouver General Hospital. Their inclusion criteria includes cases with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, which affect the proper histologic assessment, repeated cases, and adenal squamous cell carcinoma. All the slides were reviewed and reclassified under the IECC criteria uh, using a combination of histology, P16, uh, IHCs and HPV RNA in cyto hybridization. So this slide shows the clinical pathologic data sets. And for the pathologic uh, criteria, uh, characteristics recorded after slides review, HPV-associated morphology 
is uh, well known with a people uh, mitotic figures and apoptotic bodies presented as scanning magnification. And the stromal invasion, they use the SOVA pattern, a, a brief uh, description of the SOVA pattern. Pattern A shows well demarcated glands with rounded contour, no destructive stromal invasion, no single cell uh, detachment, no LVI or solid uh, components. Pattern B uh, shows limited destructive stromal invasion arising from pattern A uh, with some desmoplastic or inflamed stroma, while pattern C shows diffuse destructive stromal invasion with confluent growth pattern. Um, for the grading, they use a cap checklist mainly based on the component of solid growth and the nuclear apidia. For the mutational analysis, they use HE slides with a uh, next generation sequencing panel, including 33 genes. So let's look at the results. A total of 100 cases were included, which uh, includes 85 cases of HPV associated uh, cases and 15 cases of HPV independent. In HPV associate group, no mucinous signaling type or uh, invasive stratified mucin producing carcinoma, also known as ISMC type. In the HPV independent group, no endometrioid type. So this is a busy slide, let me break it down. Uh, compared with HPV associate group, HPV independent group shows older patient age, larger tumor size, and more frequent uh, margin, uh, positive margins. Uh, in terms of SOVA pattern, HPV associate uh, group shows about 50% of pattern C, 30% of pattern B, and 20% of pattern A, while in HPV independent group, all the cases shows pattern C. Uh, in terms of GRID and LVI, there's no differences between the two uh, groups. Um, also, HPV associate group shows more stage one cases, while HPV independent group shows more uh, higher stage as stage two and three. Uh, HPV independent group, uh, um, the patient are more likely to have uh, post-surgical treatment. For the correlation of clinical pathologic parameters with outcomes in their univariant analysis, they, said they show that irrespective of HPV status, higher stage correlate significantly with both disease-specific survival, progression-free survival, but not overall survival. Margin positivity correlate with birth prognosis. LVI only correlate with PFS. Um, there's no correlation between age, tumor size, tumor grade, or SOVA pattern with prognosis. In their multivariant analysis, only margin status and LVI remained statistically significant. Um, they also show that HPV associate group demonstrated superior survival compared with HPV independent group. There's no statistic differences between the HPV associate group uh, UUO type versus other sub subgroup. That may be because it's a very small number cohort and there's no ISMC and other rare subtype in their cohort. Also, there's no outcome differences detected among the HPV I sub subtypes. Also, um, it because only 15 cases are included in their HPV I group. There's uh, no correlation between SOVA pattern and lymph node metastasis. Uh, in their cohort, there's only four cases uh, had nodal metastasis. So it limit and preclude a comprehensive analysis of correlation with SOVA patterns. Uh, this slide shows the genetic profile. Uh, there are uh, 71 cases included in uh, which includes 55 cases of HPV A associated and 16 cases of HPV in independent. In the HPV associated group, KRAS, PIX3CA, and GNAS are most common uh, mutations, while TP53 is rare in HPV A group, and it accounts 
about 30% in the HPV independent group. There are certain like nonsense mutation disruptive inferent mutation in the HPV A group, while in HPV I group, all the mutations are missense mutation. Uh, they found that ERBB2 irrespect of HPV status correlate with worse progression free survival, while they didn't find any other uh, correlation of gene mutations with survival. So this study provides independent validation of the clinical pathologic and prognostic significance of the IECC systems. And also along with the previous studies show that HPVA versus HPVI and the cervical identity carcinoma ratio is about four to one. HPV independent group uh, cases occurred at older age, presented with higher FIGO stage with large tumor size, and we're more likely to have positive margin and LBI. And SOVA pattern only valuable in the stratification of HPV associated group. HPVI animal carcinoma demonstrated worse overall survival, progression free survival, and disease specific survival when compared with HPVA uh, groups. And the FIGO grade failed to correlate with. Uh, HPVA or HPVI classification or outcome. Uh, so let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of this uh, paper. That, uh, the strength is that it revalidates the IECC system in an independent data set. And there are certain areas for improvement. First, this, is, uh, uh, this cohort contains limited cases and uh, no number of molecular events uh, preclude uh, to identify any mutations that were definitively discriminatory between the HPVA and HPVI group or their subtype. And their uh, next generation sequencing panel only contains 33 genes. It also precludes an in depth and comprehensive analysis of endocervical adenocarcinoma. For the application, uh, the IECC provided a simple hierarchical scheme where the first major ECA division is determined by the HPV status. And this new classification demonstrated greater inter-observer reproducibility and clinical relevance than the 2014 WHO classification. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. That was excellent. and. Um... Once again, um, that was a complex paper to get through, and I think you did a good job uh, breaking down the important parts and summarizing and sharing the data in a way that made it um, able and digestible, I suppose, for a general audience. And um, you know, this concept of HPV associated versus HPV not associated, and kind of reporting cervical cancer in that fashion is a relatively new concept. So um, it's good to go back and look at these papers and. Um, now, I think I have all the, everyone in the meeting has their camera on, so that's great. So um, let's see, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so I will go ahead and start with Dr. Mendoza, um, who also had a complicated paper to summarize. And I guess, um, you know, looking at the invasive stratified mucin producing carcinomas, um, I think one thing that was very evident to me in these papers is, uh, you know, they're, they're method was that they went back and looked at all of their cases to see if they had, there was a component of this in other cancers and had some expert GYN people review them and there was. So um, it makes you wonder, um, it's sort of like once an entity gets named, then we start seeing it and reporting it more. And in the past, it was probably like you said, just called like adenosquamous or something very poorly differentiated. So what was your biggest takeaway as someone who's wrapping up her GYN fellowship? Um, from this paper and do you think it will kind of stay with you going forward? And you're muted right now, just so you know, just unmute yourself, there you go. Actually, that is my number one take on point from this paper is just to be aware of the importance of recognizing even, you know, a small amount of IC ISMC components in these tumors. You know, it's very easy to just dismiss everything as just pure adidose famous or just usual type at the cervical adenocarcinoma. So right. it is, you know, it kind of re-emphasized to me everything I've like encountered five 
ISMC cases during my fellowship. And yeah. all of them, I think they were like that. It was famous. I think I was about to just discuss them as even age sale, a visual type adenocarcinoma. So it is yeah. very challenging in real practice. And I'm yeah. glad also that the paper suggested the use of this simple panel to just see, you know, if you see anything weird in the morphology or it's, it looks like a mixed architecture or a logic appearance, then you can uh, apply, you know, tax A, CK5, 6, and P63 in these tumors. Yeah, and, and it, it sort of reminds me of like the, the concept of, you know, like um, serous borderline tumors and people talk about sampling criteria. I know they didn't really get into that in the paper, but that would be another interesting thing to look at is, I mean, obviously finding these things would probably be more likely if you sampled more. So if you have a an adenocarcinoma of the cervix that has multiple morphologies, you know, keep an eye out for this and also send yourself back to the bucket, which is always something I do because it not only helps you, but it also buys you an extra day to think, right? So, or day or two. So yeah, that's a, those are really good points. So uh, Dr. Balakarishan, I think um, also you did a great job summarizing your paper and you know, this is Dr. Talia's paper, so I'll try not to be biased, but I, I, you know, we already talked about how it was very well written and um, you brought up a really interesting point, which I think um, Dr. Wolski also brought up in our practice session about having a control group for these. And um, something that crossed my mind when you were saying that was, I wonder how many people even report to a tuba endometrial metaplasia in a hysterectomy. I don't know that I would, which leads you to say, like, how would you design that study? Would you just have to look at like a lot of benign hysterectomies to go find this and then, you know, find a, I suppose if it was atypical and I had considered calling it something atypical, I would probably mention it. So maybe it would be a little easier to find those cases in the file, but um, it would certainly be um, an elbow grease kind of study, like a, you know, brute force, like you'd have to do a lot of looking at slides, but that's a really good point. Um, so what, as someone who's getting ready to start his GYN fellowship, did you, what did you learn from that? Like, what was your biggest takeaway point from this article? Yeah, so my biggest takeaway, and we talked about this before, is the way the paper was written. I feel like the skill like involved in like really compressing all the history behind this lesion into like a succinct form was something yes. like, uh, I feel like as a young pathologist, I would definitely love to like write something like that. You know, it would really make me understand like a particular entity yeah. I know these days a lot of papers have so many so much data and molecular findings so a lot of the history and the premise is lost or is condensed but I think the authors here did a really good job in doing that so for me the biggest takeaway was the way it was written right right and that's that's a really good point too and I find that um the best teachers um, that you'll have across the scope are able to sort of weave that into sign out, right? But it's hard when you're young and you weren't around and you don't know the history to really get all of that from a textbook because it's not really going to be there. And it's 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 kind of a nebulous place. Where do you find this information? And um, yeah, so I suppose what you could always do is just go find a paper that Dr. McCluggage wrote about that topic because odds are he probably did. <laughs> he could read that there. So yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so we look forward to your discussions in the future, Dr. Balakarish, and I'll be on the lookout for that. Um, and then Dr. Zhang, uh, your paper also was pretty molecular heavy as well. Um, and one thing that I thought about as you were talking about, you were talking about how you know some of their findings weren't as strong as they wanted them to be. You found that they weren't finding um, uh, relations between um, statistical significance between survival and certain variables that we know are significant and they're probably just underpowered, right? Like they just didn't have like a lot of cases with certain findings and they're doing that is JIP study right now, which they're, you know, in the process of publishing. So that'll be, we're sort of waiting to find that. But in the meantime, we have papers like this that help us. So as someone who's a couple years away from her GYN fellowship and just survived boards, I assume. So, you know, congratulations, you seem to be in one piece. Um, what did you take away from this and how do you think you'll it'll stay with you in the future? So I think the IECC criteria uh, provide a very sim uh, 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 relatively simple uh, hierarchy for us. So yeah. divided them into HPV associated and HPV independent. It's right. kind of like, a, a, like squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck area, which mm -hmm. divided into HPV associated and not associated. And right. as we all know that HPV associated with a better prognosis. Mm -hmm. So it can, I think with the application of IECC criteria in the cervical annual carcinoma, it, if we 
do the HPV as a uh, stain for all the cases, I think it will better guide the clinical management in right. the future. And also like if we do this criteria in the future, we are gonna uh, gain a, a more cases and it will enrich our experience in this kind of uh, new carcinoma and better classify them. Yeah, yeah, sort of sort out the the bad actors from the maybe better actors with the exception of course of Dr. Mendoza's cases, which are both HPV associated and bad actors, but that's that's why we're here to keep learning. So um, Dr. Wolski, would you like to add anything or just um, say hello to everyone since you're gonna be in charge of this eventually? Hi everyone, I am Dr. Becca Wolski. It's great to see everybody who's joined and I just want to congratulate the presenters each of you did a phenomenal job on providing an informative summary of the paper and hitting those high points. Yeah, great. Great, well, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone. And let me just make sure you have double check, no questions. You all answered everyone's questions just by uh, doing your presentations, which is what we're aiming for. So thank you everyone. And in the audience, remember on your way out, a little screen will pop up to fill out a um, survey, which helps us sort of modify things and know where you're coming from and what we can do better. So fill that out if you have time and uh, we will see you in July. Thanks everyone. Bye.